The issue is that in getting wrapped up in this controversy over whole life insurance completely blinds us to the true problem that we face. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents channel. My name is Jesse Durham. Today we're going to be discussing the controversy over whole life insurance and how we arrive at also discussing the infinite banking concept as conceived and described in R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Welcome to the show. And again, when folks say, I'm getting into so much here, but when folks say, buy term and invest the difference, and, 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 and again, they talk about, well, you'll get 12% in the market and the market does nothing but go up. You just got to ride the roller coaster. Don't jump off. The only time people uh, get hurt is when they try and jump off of a, a moving roller coaster. I get that uh, analogy. Here's my question. What if it's your time to use the access that, that, that you need? to supplement your income or to enjoy retirement or just survive in retirement years. What if the roller coaster happens to be plummeting at the time that you need to be able to access capital that you've been putting away for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? How do you tell somebody in their 60s, 70s to ride it out? when they're at the time of wanting to supplement their income or enjoy some golden years here. Okay. I mean, I, I, I had a phone call recently where somebody was telling me about uh, someone a bit more mature than myself about a loss of right around $50,000 in, in one of their accounts that's, that's connected to the market and uh, what those implications meant, you know, what uh, and, and they took it in stride. They, uh, to their credit, they, they took it in stride. Very productive person. Very productive. Very profitable in, in their business. But again, if, if we saw a dollar on the ground and we'd bend over and pick it up, seeing, seeing 50000 go down in, in one of our accounts, um, we're not thrilled about it. So going back to the fees and the penalties, these are the same folks that talk about compound interest. Well, what about the compounding of fees over the course of 10, 20, 30, 40 years of contributing to a qualified plan? And here's a thought that some have it considered. When it comes time, time to pay taxes on this amount, we pay taxes on the full amount, and we also pay compounded fees in these qualified plans on the full amount, even though we're taxed on the full amount. So we're paying fees on the amount that goes to Uncle Sam. We foot that bill. Just interesting food for thought. I'm not giving investment advice here. We're just having a discussing about a discussion about the banking function and who controls it. So you invest in what you want to invest in. I'm here to promote the idea that you can become your own banker. Educate and learn and, and with your experience and skills, invest and, and build and do business where you want to do. But who controls the banking function over those things? So that leads us to discussing this controversy of whole life insurance and ultimately the infinite banking concept. Because we need to have the discussion about who controls in your business, who controls the banking function in your own private home, your household. Who controls the banking function if you are an investor? Who controls the financing of your investing? Because we only finance a couple of ways. Either we are leveraging someone else's money, and we do that on their terms and, and conditions. We're, we're conventionally borrowing. We do that on their terms and conditions. We're paying them interest dollars. So that's, that's a percentage that goes to someone else that we will never see again. And we're beholden to them and give them two years of financials or whatever we have to do to be able to see if we qualify. Or we amass capital somewhere, money, and we forfeit the opportunity to earn on that that we otherwise could have enjoyed. We miss out on economic value that could have been added to our capital. Well, the third option is become your own banker. Amass capital in a privately owned appreciating asset and leverage the capital from that asset to do the things that you are going to do anyway, to finance the things that you are going to do anyway. And then recapture that 
back into that appreciating asset, your own privatized banking system. So you pay your, the three rules of infinite banking are you pay yourself first and you pay yourself with interest. If you're, if you're going to leverage this, do what the banks do. Pay yourself interest. And then ultimately, when you deploy that capital for whatever it is you're doing, recapture that back into your system. And then you can grow and expand that, grow and expand that, grow and expand that. So when folks are talking about buy term and invest the difference, they're overlooking what's the real problem. The real problem is, is the same folks that want to talk about 10% here, 12% there, saving money, getting out of debt. And I'm not saying that these are bad things to consider and to talk about and, and, and to address in your own life is the borrower a servant to the lender? No kidding. So I believe that you should be both. What if what if you were your own banker? <laughs> Fulfill that entire relationship yourself. So these are good things to address, but the same folks that are going to argue over rates of return and return on investment and these percentage points, they're overlooking the entire cash flows that we have come through our households or our businesses or our investment portfolios. And who controls the banking function? Who controls the financing of those things? So we're trying to talk about this sliver over here instead of the whole, the whole enchilada, the whole enchilada, la enchilada. Um, get to use a little bit of my, my Spanish accent right there. Y de veras, yo hablé español. Ha pasado un buen tiempo desde comunicado regularmente, pero todavía puedo hacer bastante. Pues, all right, sorry. Um, so I used to be a, a, a high school Spanish teacher. If you didn't know, I've, I've traveled abroad a good bit to Spanish-speaking countries. I'm rusty. If you speak Spanish, you probably you might have certain opinions about how I said those things. Regardless, the whole enchilada, Okay. Instead of just focusing on a rate of return on one thing, let's look at our entire cash flows. Let's look at who controls the banking function in our lives. That's what I'm getting at. So in getting into the controversy of whole life insurance, term life insurance, the vast, vast majority, unless you've been exposed to this idea of becoming your own banker, we're overlooking the problem of controlling the bank, the banking function as it pertains to us. Likewise, Let's let's point out some some natural laws that exist. There's this law of motion. So the same folks that would say, well, buy term, invest the difference. What they're saying is, is, well, you should park your money consistently and a significant percentage of your income should go towards these qualified plans and saving for college for the kids and all this different stuff. Well, the idea of set it and forget it, the idea of parking your money violates the natural law of motion and it's it's really life and death okay so the heavens the 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 celestial atmosphere is in motion even you know i'm told and, and you can look in a microscope even even seemingly inanimate objects are in motion but you know the the ions of an inanimate object are are, are in motion so our lungs breathe air, our, our, our veins and arteries pump blood, rivers, oceans, there's this water system, Nash talks about that um, to much effect in, in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, that whole ecosystem, the environment. And again, that's all that all points to the problem. Folks are looking at this one thing instead of seeing the, the big picture of the, the flow of money or the, the flow of water. That's the comparison that he makes. But this set it and forget it mentality, that's not what the banks are doing. And what do the banks look like? Aren't they the best looking buildings in the best parts of town with the best kept grounds, with the best dressed folks inside? Right. So the banks don't park money. They have it in motion. It is moving. It's turning over. If we showed up at a bank, deposited a bill that we wrote our name on, $20 bill, let's say, we can't come back in an hour and ask for it. That same one. 
It's gone. It's moving. It's at work. It's not being set somewhere and forgotten. It's working. So the natural law of motion. And the Nash, of course, goes on to talk about Willie Sutton's law. Folks will try to steal your money or they will at least try and deprive you of it legally or illegally. And he talks about the illegal part and, you know, tax and what that means. And, you know, I would say this. Robert Kiyosaki calls taxes the largest eroder to wealth. Nash talks about onerous taxation, and then he talks about, you know, the interesting point that the same entity that would come up with onerous taxation would also try and provide some exemptions to that taxation, i.e. qualified plans, food for thought. So Willie Sutton's Law, the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules, period, period. I understand that there are folks out there that will say, well, love of money or no, they'll, they'll actually say, money is the root of all evil. It's not. That's not even a correct quote. I actually began to say it correctly. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money's just a tool. Money's a tool like this pen is a tool, like this really cool knife is a tool. It's just a tool, okay? And if, if you have a tool, you can use it. Letter opener here. If I have this letter opener here, I can use it. If I don't, I can't. The golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So if we're systematically amassing capital and a system of policies that we own and control for our need of finance, we're more capable, we're better positioned than if we didn't. It's that simple. Use it or lose it. Either we are paying interest or forfeiting the opportunity to earn interest. I've already spoken about that. There are only a couple of ways to finance. We borrow somebody else's money on their terms and conditions, and we pay them interest, or we set aside our capital, and it is, it's it's lazy dollars. It's not doing anything for sure. It's amassing. Sure, it's but again, I mean, you know, what risk do we assume there? And and those dollars are being lazy, so we're forfeiting the opportunity to earn interest. Use it or lose it. Nash talks about the arrival syndrome, thinking, I know that. Or, and that's really interesting because what he would often, or who he would often quote was Will Rogers when he would say, the problem in, in America isn't so much that people don't know something, anything, but that they think they know and it just ain't so. So folks that think they know something, folks that think, well, why would I, why would I borrow my own money and pay the insurance company interest? You think you know something, but it's just not so, as you're saying it. Or someone that says, well, yeah, but they keep the cash value. They don't pay that to you with the face amount, with the death benefit. They keep that cash value, the dirty, rotten scoundrels. Okay. They think they know something, and it just ain't so. And that's not me judging. That's just saying they... they, they they may be experiencing what Nash called the arrival syndrome. They've, they've been successful in some things, and they're not willing to submit to learning more about that thing or, or questioning their perspective or their, or their thinking. And that's fine. I face the same issues myself. And what I work towards is being a perpetual student, always reading, always looking to have quality conversations to grow and expand myself. These laws, these natural laws, they apply to everyone in all of these situations. Whether you are setting your money and forgetting it, investing in qualified plans, following, following some, some system, uh, whether, whether that looks like, well, getting out of debt, setting aside three to six months of living expenses, investing a certain percentage into my retirement paying the house down early, uh, saving for college, whatever that, that may look like. And that's, that's just a rough draft of one way of going about things. You know, another could be, well, opium, other people's money, leverage, leverage, leverage all the day long, assets over liabilities. See, no matter what camp you're in, no matter what your perspective is, natural laws are just natural laws. Gravity if I let go of this knife, it's going to just going to come crashing down on my desk here. It's a natural 
law. No matter how I look at that situation, that's what's going to happen. If I let that knife go, it's going to drop down to my desk. Gravity exists. So this law of motion and Willie Sutton's law and the arrival syndrome and all the golden rule, all these, they apply everywhere to everyone. So that's the food for thought to consider. Now, again, I've asked, well, what about banks, right? Best looking buildings in the best part of town with the best kept grounds, the best looking people inside uh, that are paid to run that. Well, I know that there are many adamant voices on both sides of this controversy of whole life insurance. Let me ask this, and this is something worth considering. Who buys it? I mean, the end, the industry itself predates our tax system predates the IRS here. Life insurance had been around for a long, 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 long time before the IRS even began in 1913. So, so let's just, who buys it? Who buys whole life insurance? Let's, let's talk about some examples here. Banks. Banks own life insurance, whole life insurance. Banks own more than anyone else, banks are the largest purchasers of whole life insurance. How can you find this out for yourself? Boldly. Look it up. Boldly. Look into this. Bank-owned life insurance. Banks are the largest purchasers of life insurance. Now, again, why is that? And are banks, are banks doing well or are they doing poorly financially? Are they practicing things that maybe the layperson is not practicing or, or, or taught to practice? Perhaps. Look into that. Banks, commercial banks, are the largest purchasers of whole life insurance. BOLI, bank-owned life insurance. And there, there are other acronyms out there. COLI, company-owned life insurance, etc. That's, that's also uh, something that you might come across. How about J.C. Penney? During the Great Depression, so 1929... J.C. Penney used capital from more than one life insurance policy to cover payroll and, and, and to run business during the Great Depression. And of course, still in business today. So interesting to know that they leveraged their cash values to stay in business. Foster Farms, 1939, borrowed $1,000 against their life insurance policies to begin and now... They provide products worldwide. Walt Disney, 1955, when he couldn't get the kind of financing that he wanted conventionally, leveraged some life policies, uh, whole life insurance policies that he personally had. Walt Disney personally had these life insurance policies. Leverage those cash values to be able to begin Disneyland. Now, here's here's been my question about this one in particular. The same folks that would bash on whole life insurance, and maybe they have, maybe they haven't. I don't know, but maybe they've enjoyed some Disney movies in their lifetime. Maybe they've enjoyed taking their kids to an amusement park that was funded and begun. When conventional lending wasn't enough, wouldn't get on board with this idea of having a clean, family-friendly amusement park instead of the trashy, trashy, dirty types of places that were prevalent at that time. But Walt Disney leveraged the cash values in more than one personally owned life insurance policy that he had to begin Disneyland. Maybe folks that bash whole life insurance have even enjoyed the fruits from whole life insurance it's a, it's an interesting thought how about ray Kroc? 1961 he purchased mcdonald's from the mcdonald's brothers with cash values from two policies that he had and now they serve billions that's with a b billions in 1980 doris christopher borrowed $3,000 from a life insurance policy she had to launch Pampered Chef, the Pampered Chef. Now, personally, I can say I have those products in my household. My wife loves them, and we have them. Personally, perhaps you have too. Use $3,000 
from her life insurance policy to launch the Pampered Chef, trying to put quality, um, uh, and I don't represent that company. I don't, I, I'm not a representative of the Pampered Chef. I just enjoy products from the company, and so does my wife. And now that company has been procured and bought by Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, but that's that's an interesting point about their beginnings. Three thousand dollars leverage from life insurance, whole life insurance. In eighteen ninety seven, Stanford University was kept open because of the benefits from a life insurance policy payout over about a, a six year. There was a six year financial difficult financially difficult time for Stanford University around. Uh, the end of that century, and because of proceeds from a whole life insurance policy, that university was able to keep its doors open. Perhaps worthy of note as well is that uh, President Biden has uh, four policies with mutual life insurance companies. Now, for my sports folks out there, Jim Harbaugh and uh, Dabo Swinney, have both been compensated. And there's some interesting stories there. Uh, there's even a, an, an article uh, for the Michigan coach, Harbaugh. Um, there's an entering, interesting article that you can find on how he's been compensated. And perhaps we'll talk about it on, on a future episode uh, more depth. Because it's, it's really in, the business implications of whole life insurance. They're really interesting. But have been compensated via whole life insurance policies between them and their respective universities. And then for myself personally, having read through Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad's Guide to Investing, that's his third book in a particular series uh, that began with uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Then his second book was Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrants. And then the third is The Guide to Investing. I marked several pages, 52, I mean, if you're interested, 52, 53, 86, 255, where he mentions how, you know, there are certain things that are key on those pages, the importance of having a professional financial team around you. And obviously that could include, he says, um, insurance professionals. And he also talks about how, Certain kinds of insurance can be used for funding projects or 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 investments or or expenses, and obviously how certain insurance can be a hedge against certain risks that you assume as an investor. So, I enjoyed the book. I encourage you to in, check that book out if you're interested. Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Guide uh, to Investing and his other books they've been really interesting. My point being. It's valuable to figure out who buys whole life insurance and then ask, well, why do they buy it? You know, and if you've listened for any amount of time or if we've already had the opportunity to have personal conversations, then, then, you know, that's what we're doing on this channel is we're showing you how you can become your own banker. And we do that using the best asset that I know of for the financing purpose. It's properly structured, whole life policies with a mutual company that pays dividends. And if you're on your journey of, of vetting this idea and learning about whole life insurance and uh, R. Nelson Nash and his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, and you know what I'm doing on this channel here, then I would encourage you to keep reading, keep listening, keep learning. Don't let that arrival syndrome get you. Keep studying. And if you'd like to have a conversation about how you can implement the infinite banking concept into your household or your investing, or your business, then you can reach me at 828-817-4223 or you can email DurhamTalents at gmail.com. It's been a great pleasure for me. I look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day. Take care. I'm a net light trigger. Put that piece shooter down. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Mira, la cosa es esta. Que tú y yo necesitamos hablar, ¿vale? Pues, I feel like a champ. I feel like an absolute champ. Why, Jesse, you look so dashing. <laughs>